ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Betty Junard. Good morning, everyone. Hi. So let's do this fortune cookie thing. Oh, it's hiding from me. Hang on, hang on, hang on. All right. Excitement and intrigue from the audience will follow you closely throughout your presentation. It's a tall order when you go on the day after the party. <laughs> Welcome to DockerCon day two. I hope everyone had a great time at the party last night. Did you? Yes. But it looks like maybe not too much fun because I do see so many of you here bright and early. For those of you that know me, you know I love to take Docker selfies at events like this. It's just really a fun icebreaker and a great way to connect and meet new people. I did get quite a few last night, but there are 5,000 of you, so I'm going to have to step up my game if I'm going to kind of meet that target by the end of this conference. You know, my first DockerCon was also in San Francisco when I joined Docker about three years ago, and it was quite an experience. And as you can see, this also lines up with roughly the time I figured out how to use Twitter, and also when my love of Docker selfies was born. I'm also really excited for us to be back in San Francisco for DockerCon to see how much this conference and community has grown. It is both humbling and a tremendous honor to be part of this journey with you. Thank you. Before we jump into another full day of learning and connections, I wanted to start by reflecting on some of the moments from day one. First, without question, is the incredible momentum, and that's all because of you. Over one million new applications have been developed by over a million new developers that have joined us in the last year. Collectively, we have downloaded over 50 billion containers from the Docker Hub since we've launched the service. 50 billion! Mm -hmm. Over 500 organizations have also entrusted their most critical applications to the Docker Enterprise Edition platform. And because of that, our promise to you is to always ensure your freedom of choice your agility, and ever-present security in the container platform that you use in your organizations. We also announced um, three new areas of innovations so that we can continue fulfilling on that promise. First, the enhancements to the developer experience to make it really easy for new developers to get started on the platform um, by using uh, templates and workflows and a graphical user interface. And for IT operations teams, the ability to bring together many disparate silos with federated application management across any cloud, even cloud-hosted Kubernetes services. And last but not least, extending Docker Enterprise Edition's integration of Kubernetes to Windows Server, continuing to deliver choice, agility, and security for you, no matter where you are on your journey. And everyone's journey is different and unique. But no matter where you are, it always starts with a single moment. And let's talk about moments for a second here. When you think about moments, they can be large, they can be small, they can be inconsequential or a pivotal turning point. And these moments happen all the time. Sometimes we don't even notice them. The right moment in time when technology and your preferences change together and then cross paths. For example, when ride-sharing apps took off, it's because mobile phones became smart enough, the network became big enough, and people like us wanted more options in getting around town. Or when ordinary people, like all of us in this room, were ready to let the entire world know where we were and what we were doing at any given point in time. <coughs> Hashtag Docker selfie. These moments can be serious, they can be fun, but they are moments that launch an entirely new way of doing things. And we all need to be attuned to these moments because they're changing tides and entire industries have been vanished or have been turned upside down in a blink of an eye. And especially for all of us in this room and for everyone joining online, because we live and breathe technology every day, you know, we keep track of all the latest projects, all the new features, and get really deep into the details. And that's fantastic. But what's important for us is that we must not forget to take a step back, to not miss our moment. That moment where we need to decide, do we either simply protect what we've always built, just leave it as it is, or do we lean into the change and become the disruption? 
disrupting our business with new ideas, new services, or ideas to renovate what we have. So as we start DockerCon Day 2, let's ask ourselves, what holds us back? What propels us to the future? What will be our answer when we face our moment? And how can we be sure that we seize it? And to help put this all into perspective, I'm really excited for our guest speaker, innovation expert and best-selling book author, uh, Robert Tursek. Hey. hey, Robert, thank you. Thank you. Hi. It's customary to make a sacrifice to the demo gods. Let's hope I get this right. My fortune says, um, may your presentation have as many twists and turns as Lombard Street. <laughs> We're going to find out in a minute. Let's get started. Well, welcome, 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 everybody. Welcome to the second day of DockerCon. And welcome, welcome to the Software Defined Society. You see, I think that we're all collectively working on a really grand experiment, a gigantic undertaking. Together, the, the 5,000 people in this room and the thousands of organizations that you represent and the thousands of other people that are watching the live stream, collectively what we're doing is we're rewriting the way society works. Instead of a society where the rules are written in a law book, I believe in the future, the way the world's gonna work is that it'll be a society governed by software, where the rules are encoded in software that governs every human interaction and every transaction between people and between people and machines. That's the grand project that we're working on. I'm excited to take part in it. Welcome to the Software Defined Society. And of course, container-based virtualization plays a fundamental role in making this happen. Now today, there'll be a whole bunch of other speakers who are gonna show you inspiring examples of what you can do with Docker containers. I'm not gonna do that. What I'm gonna try to do is link this phenomenon to a much bigger trend. And make no mistake, Docker is a phenomenon. It's incredible. They showed me this chart, and I said, that is amazing. It looks to me like Docker is the fastest growing piece of software in history. And actually, this chart's out of date. Uh, you just heard it from Betty. The real figure is 50 billion polls, 50 billion downloads. That's quite extraordinary if you think about it. 50 billion polls. That means this chart is doubling faster than I can even keep up with it. Uh, you hear a lot of folks in San Francisco, futurist folks, talk about exponential growth of accelerating technologies. Folks, this is what exponential growth looks like. And it's no accident. Yeah, right on, right on. It's no accident. Docker containers solve really serious problems. For the last 10 years, we've kind of decomposed the server-side stack. Uh, replace that software with a series of microservices. It seems like an endless, endlessly long list, a growing list of microservices. And that's a really brilliant architecture, but it introduces all kinds of complexity. And Dockers are like the perfect vessel for managing and orchestrating those, those, service, uh, those microservices. So that's one thing that Docker does. But the other reason Docker is growing so fast is that we're starting to change the way we think about the cloud. You see, this idea of like a, a one-size-fits-all public cloud, that doesn't work for everybody. Some people need data on-prem. They're required by regulation or by SLAs to have data on-prem. Other folks need compute power right at the edge, and these people need hybrid cloud. And no company wants to be locked into a single vendor, so everybody needs a multi-cloud strategy. And again, as you heard yesterday and you'll hear today, Docker provides solutions for that as well. What Docker's really doing then is it's unleashing a torrent of innovation. A lot of companies that are interested in the cloud were a little bit hesitant to get into it. Docker frees them. Docker, give, Docker gives those companies uh, 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 the control of their fate. They control their own destiny. That's incredibly liberating. That's a new way to think about the cloud. And that's one of the reasons why you're seeing that phenomenal growth. When we talk about the cloud, we, some people define it very narrowly. They talk about it as a way to save money, a way to maximize your, your OpEx. That's definitely true, but I think that's a really narrow way to define it. You know, software is a substitute for physical infrastructure. Sure, that's definitely true. And again, Docker helps you be more efficient. Uh, you're able to optimize how you use server-side resources. No question about it. But I think there's a much more interesting phenomenon at work here. It's the cloud as an accelerant. See, the cloud speeds things up. 
And in particular, the cloud speeds up innovation. It's speeding up innovation at a rate that we can all barely keep up with. Yesterday, I spent all afternoon talking to executives from some of the companies here, and all of them expressed how fast things have accelerated in the last 18 months, and they expect that to continue into the future. The cloud accelerates innovation in several different ways. One of the ways it does it is internally, inside of your organization. Every one of the thousands of developers that are re present in this room today, every one of the organizations you're at has now adopted an agile development methodology. You shift it over to DevOps, and that means that you're in a process of continuously releasing code. We saw examples of that yesterday, where you can actually launch an app in minutes. So that means you're able to continuously test, continuously ask your customers, how are we doing? Did we get it right? You continuously get that feedback. You continuously make improvements. That's like a conversation with customers. And so I think actually DevOps methodology isn't just something that's confined to the IT department or the development team. It's actually going to change the way companies are organized. I would not be surprised to see more and more companies adopt DevOps as their organizational principle in the future. As we spend more and more time in digital environments and as companies migrate more and more functions to the cloud, I think you're going to start to see that DevOps methodology spread through entire organizations. And that's great news for the IT leaders who are here for the CIOs, the chief digital officers who are present and who are watching. I think it's great news for you because it means you're going to have the ability to define the way your company is organized in the future. The experience you're developing right now is going to start to shape how your entire enterprise looks in the future. So that's one way that the cloud is driving innovation. It's reshaping organizations and making them more agile. That's one way. But there's another way the cloud drives innovation. It's competition. A couple years ago, the folks at Upfront Ventures published this chart, and it blew my mind. It shows a 1,000-fold decrease in the cost of launching a new business. And there's two principal reasons for that. The advent of open source software and then the launch of cloud services that drove down the cost by 1,000-fold for startup companies. And so what we're starting to see is a proliferation of new businesses across every single industry. That's increasing competition, and of course, what that's going to do is drive innovation. It's not limited to the IT business or the software business. My friend Andrew Heslow is a biohacker, and he was trying to explain uh, synthetic biology to me. <laughs> and he said, look, you can do this all in the cloud. The laboratories are available as a cloud-based service now. So he said, look, the next, the next biotech billionaire will start her company at a Starbucks with a cell phone and a laptop computer, and she'll use her credit card to put all the infrastructure on the cloud. She won't necessarily need to raise a huge amount of upfront capital to launch that business. And that idea is not limited to biology. That's happening in agriculture tech, fintech, and across 100 different sectors. So we're starting to see a huge amount of creativity unleashed in startup businesses because the cost of launching a business is just so cheap right now. Yesterday, Gareth told us that we are living in the golden age of developer tools. That's definitely true, and I think there's actually a bigger idea behind that. We are living in the golden age of tools in general. Right now, there are literally thousands of cloud-based tools that enable small businesses to launch at very low cost or even no cost. Many of these apps are available at no cost. And they'll allow a small business to operate just like a large business. They allow small businesses to manage things like payroll and employees, manage projects, manage projects long distance, manage communication, storage, sharing of files, even e-commerce. All of these solutions are available at almost no cost. So again, that's driving down the cost of launching a startup, and that's accelerating innovation. It really is true now. You can launch a business from your home. I think everybody knows somebody who's doing something like that. But even more important, what this picture is trying to show is that there's a new idea enabled by the cloud, and that is placeless innovation. Placeless innovation. Innovation can happen anywhere. It used to be you had to move to Silicon Valley if you wanted to be a part of the startup scene. But recently, the famous investor Peter Thiel made an interesting statement. He complained. He expressed frustration about the cost of operating a business in Silicon Valley. He said most of the money that he gives to startup companies goes to landlords in the form of lease payments for office space, but also a huge portion of the salaries that are paid to those employees goes in the form of rent. He actually referred to the landlords as slumlords. And he said he's moving out of Silicon Valley. He's frustrated with the high cost of launching a startup business here. But thanks to all these cloud-based tools, you can now launch a business anywhere. I was just in Moscow. Before that, I was in Warsaw, in Stockholm. In a couple weeks, I'm going to be down in Australia, in Adelaide, in Sydney. Everywhere I go, I meet startup companies that are using these cloud-based tools to innovate, to launch businesses cheap and fast. Now, you might be thinking, why is this guy talking about so much competition? That's a little bit scary. Sure, it's true. I mean, we get freaked out when we think about the proliferation of competition, but competition is actually a good thing. 
I was in Bangkok and I was watching these boxers sparring at Lumpini Stadium and it made me realize competition is good because it brings out our best game. It causes us to get better at what we do. Competition drives innovation. I want to talk about a concept. I'm going to introduce one concept here. The adjacent possible. You may have heard of the adjacent possible if you read Stephen Johnson's books. He talked about it in the book, Where Ideas Come From. But the idea of the adjacent possible was coined by a complexity theorist named Stuart Kaufman. And Stuart was looking at biological systems and he had a realization. He said, you know, every new idea, when somebody comes up with a new idea, a new platform, a new technology, it makes a whole set of other new ideas imaginable for the very first time. That's what he called the adjacent possible, and it works like this. Let's take any industry, any industry, the industry that you're in. We could have a conversation about what do you think is going to happen in your industry in the next five years. And I think everybody would agree that there's a probable outcome. If all trends hold st steady, you know, if the present trends continue, we can just do a linear extrapolation forward in time, and we'll all agree that there's a kind of likely outcome that's going to happen. That's the likely future state. But everybody with ambition in every industry has a different idea. They have a desired state that they want to get that industry to move towards. Now, we have different ideas of what those desired states might be. But as you can see, there's no line that connects the present state to that desired state. How do you get there? We use a technique called backcasting. First, we define what that future desired state might be, and then we work our way backwards, and we identify all the steps that are missing, all the steps that are necessary in order for us to achieve that desired state. Each of those steps is a new idea. Each of those steps is an idea that unlocks the next part of the of the adjacent possible and gets us closer to that desired state. So think of it like this. Imagine your whole industry is inside of one room, like this, big room, and you've maxed out that room. But somebody comes up with a new idea for a way to do business in that industry. It's like they opened up a door into a new room. And so a bunch of people rush into that room and pretty soon they fill that room, but then somebody comes up with a new idea and they open up a new door to yet another room and so on and so on and so on. That's how the adjacent possible works. Each idea opens up a new room, a new possibility space that the entire industry can move into. And this isn't happening on a single dimension, this is happening on multiple dimensions simultaneously. The cloud accelerates this process because it knocks out the cost of innovation. It knocks out the risk of trying out new ideas. And so what the cloud is really doing is it's expanding the cone of possibility dramatically. Dramatically. And the scale of this opportunity is so great. Let me try to illustrate it to you. So we know every enterprise uses about 1,000 cloud-based applications. But we also know that most big enterprises have thousands of applications that they haven't yet migrated to the cloud. That's why we know this is going to continue to grow. That cone of possibility is going to continue to expand. You've probably seen these kind of charts, these landscape charts that show you all the players in a different technology sector. This one comes to us from a company called chiefmartech.com. And I love this chart. This shows marketing technologies. And you can see the proliferation of cloud-based tools for marketing. Back in 2011, they, they were tracking 150 companies, and then that doubled by 2012, and it doubled again a little bit more by 2014. Today, there's 7,000 companies that they're tracking. This is what that chart looks like today. Look at this thing. It's like going to an eye doctor. It's worse than an eye doctor's chart. You need a magnifying glass to understand it. 7,000 companies. If you just took 10 minutes to evaluate each one of these companies, it would take you more than two months to grind through this entire chart. But even this chart doesn't show you how complex the situation actually is. Because most of the companies that use these tools are now using APIs and they're weaving together their own version. So it's like recombinant technology. It's like a biological process of innovation. That's what the cloud begets, further innovation. And it is like a biological process in the sense that not every company is going to survive. It's a Darwinian process, the survival of the fittest. And what Darwin told us is it's not the strongest company that's going to survive. It's not the most intelligent group of people that's going to survive. It's the company that's best adapted to change that will survive in this period of rapid proliferation of ideas. See, it's not enough to say, oh, my company's going to adopt cloud technologies, we're, moving to, we're, we're adopting containers, and so forth. That's technological change. You also need a mandate from the leadership of your company to drive that change through the whole organization if you want to succeed. Companies have to be adaptable to change. Now, for most people, this is an invisible process. Software is hard for people to envision. If you don't live in Silicon Valley or another innovation center, it's pretty hard to get a sense of disruptive innovation. We hear about it, we talk about it, but we can't see it. It's an invisible transformation. And for most people in this country, most people who live outside of California, 
The only sign they see of disruptive innovation is a sign hanging in the window of a familiar store that says, we're going out of business, everything must go. 2017 was a brutal year for retail. Ten major chains closed. More than 10,000 shops closed. 100,000 jobs are lost. These are the people who reached an evolutionary deadhead. Organizations that are saddled with too much real estate, too much physical asset. They couldn't dematerialize fast enough. They couldn't adapt fast enough. They missed that Darwinian process. And every time one of these chains goes out of business, it reminds us of something else. It reminds us that we've given up a habit that we used to have. For instance, when Blockbuster went out of business in 2013, it reminded us that we actually no longer use DVDs and Blu-ray discs. We stream everything today. It's like we just collectively as a society gave up a habit that we all used to have. And so we didn't need that store anymore. Some folks refer to this process as dematerialization. Dematerialization into software. Dematerialization into pure information. That's kind of a cumbersome term. I have a different phrase that I love to use. I call it vaporized. Literally, we're vaporizing stuff. Things that we use every single day. They're here one day and then poof, they're gone in a puff of smoke. They disappear the next. It may seem like a fanciful notion to you, but think about it. Every one of the people in this room, all 5,000 of you, have a smartphone in your pocket. On average, you've got about 100 apps on that smartphone. And each of those 100 apps represents something that used to be sold in a physical retail shop in a box. We've dematerialized all of that. Amazon has dematerialized the book. They've vaporized the book. Amazon now sells more e-books than hardbound and paperbound books combined. The music industry has gone through this process. And now cloud-based streaming services are driving the first uptick in revenue for the music business in 10 years. Remember maps? Remember the map business? <laughs> Not a bad business, right? $15 for a piece of paper. Not a bad business to be in, but the map business has been completely changed. And a whole generation of kids are growing up with smartphones. They will never know what it means to be lost in a foreign city because of the cloud-based apps that deliver information and directions in the language of your choice. They show you where you are and where you're going next. When I brought the first mobile games to the United States in 2002, people thought I was crazy. Today, mobile games comprises the largest segment and the fastest growing segment of the $36 billion game industry. Vaporizing games has transformed the economics of the game business, and that's not all. It's also changed the way we design and build games. Today, mobile games represents about 44% of the revenue in the game industry. By 2020, it'll be half the revenue, and very soon it's going to be the biggest and fastest growing segment. Now, my colleagues and friends in the TV business hate it when I say this, but actually television's in the process of being vaporized as well. Most Americans subscribe to streaming services, right? Most Americans subscribe to more than one. All the future growth in the TV industry is going to come from cloud-based streaming services. It will not come from traditional broadcasting. And when I say we're vaporizing TV, I don't mean we're just vaporizing the disc or the video or something like that. I mean we're actually vaporizing the infrastructure of television. In the old days, if you wanted to be in TV, you had to buy a broadcast station with a big tower and some spectrum, or you had to put a satellite up in space, or you had to pull wires to the ground. That's over. Today, if you want to be in the video business, you can launch a cloud-based video streaming service in a weekend. And that's why we're seeing thousands of video-on-demand services launch all over the world. This phenomenon is not limited to the United States. This is happening on a global scale. The entire industry is shifting over to cloud-based services. So when I talk about vaporizing things, what I mean is that we're replacing physical stuff, physical things, with invisible software. And it's not limited to media. It's not just about maps and music and TV. We're actually replacing physical products. Think about it. In the last 10 years, your smartphone has absorbed the functionality of about 25 different consumer electronics devices. And for the companies that make those consumer electronics devices, the consequences have been catastrophic. Consumer electronics companies that make MP3 players and digital cameras and navigation units and so on, they've experienced double-digit decreases in sales over the last 10 years, while the smartphone has increased in sales 500-fold. So if you miss the curve, if you miss this process of dematerialization, the consequences are swift and severe. Now, I guarantee you, you're going to look at the world differently when you leave this place. Because once you start to look for vaporization, you see it everywhere. It's an invisible process, but you're going to start noticing familiar things that are disappearing from your life. We used to have this whole infrastructure for dating, for instance. Today, there's an app for it. Last winter, I got a note from my doctor's office. They said, hey, it's flu season. There's a lot of sick people in the doctor's office. Don't come here. If you want to talk to a doctor, use our mobile app. You can talk to a doctor over your phone. We're vaporizing the office visit. Companies like Uber and Lyft, they're changing transportation. They haven't vaporized the car yet, 
but they've certainly vaporized the dispatcher, and they're working very hard to vaporize the driver of that car as well, replace that person with software. When I wrote my book, Vaporized, the most controversial chapter, surprise to me, was the one about the university. See, I believe that the university is going to get vaporized as well. A lot of folks at universities resist that notion, so they didn't like it too much. But the fact is that every major university in the United States now offers a streaming version of their curriculum online for free. And you might wonder why they do that. These, these, these universities charge $30,000 to $60,000 for tuition. Why would they offer their product for free? The answer is they have no choice. They have no choice because these venture-funded, cloud-based learning platforms are designed to scale, to reach an audience of billions of people. Most of those people will never have the opportunity to set foot on an American college campus. But they're going to get a good education through a streaming video platform. You might wonder where this is going to stop. I got news for you. It won't stop. We are going to keep finding ways to replace physical stuff with software until everything that can be vaporized will be. When I wrote my book a couple years ago, there were 1.3 million apps in the Apple App Store. 1.3 million. Today, that figure is 2.8 million. And by 2020, that number will be 5 million apps. 5 million. And when we talk about 5 million apps, remember, these are things that used to be sold in a retail shop. These are things that used to be sold in a package, produced in a factory, put on a container ship. All of that is being replaced by software as well. We have a full digital supply chain that's starting to replace the physical supply chain. This is an extraordinary transformation. Economists tell us that the invisible, vaporized economy is growing at twice the rate of the real economy. By 2021, it'll be almost a $7 trillion business opportunity. And that's just the commerce around mobile phones. There's a lot of other opportunity out there. You see, when I talk about 5 million apps in the future, they're not all going to be the apps that we download today to our smartphone. Our behavior is starting to change as technology evolves us. So, for instance, in the future, your future app might consist of an intelligent chatbot inside of a messaging app like Kik. There are already 20,000 of these chatbots on Kik. Or it might be a voice command skill on Alexa or some other device that you can talk to. There's already more than 30,000 Alexa skills. So these are also a kind of vaporized app. The point I'm making is simple. Vaporization is starting to reshape the world around us. Familiar things are disappearing, and new superpowers are coming to us every single day. So the folks at the big enterprises right now, I'm imagining you're out there and you're thinking, what about us? Surely he's not going to say that we're going to vaporize a big enterprise. Uh, yes, I'm going to say that, folks. In fact, this is a 40-year trend. A couple years ago, the merchant bank Ocean Tomo published this remarkable chart. This chart shows you the components of value in companies in the S&P 500. The purple represents physical, tangible assets. The blue represents intangible assets. And what you can see is that in 1975, 85% of the value of a company was in the form of physical assets, like factories and inventory and materials and so forth. But by 2015, that had completely reversed. 84% of the value of a company is now in the form of intangible assets. This is a gigantic long-term trend. What the stock market is telling us is that they no longer value, they, put, they don't place as much value on physical assets like land, mineral resources, capital, or human labor. Instead, they're starting to place increasing amounts of emphasis on intangibles like intellectual property, proprietary data assets, the knowledge in the brains of your employees, and your proprietary business process. So what makes your companies valuable is already intangible. Wall Street's sending a very clear signal to every major company. Vaporize your business or face the consequences. There's no better illustration of this than what I call the smartphone decade. I want to show you what happened to the most valuable companies in, in the world over the last 10 years, this, these 10 years of the smartphone. This is the value of dematerialization. So back in 2006, the year before Apple introduced the iPhone, this was a list of the most valuable companies in the world, stack ranked by market capitalization. As you can see, it's dominated by energy companies like ExxonMobil, British Petroleum, and so forth. There's one tech company there, Microsoft, and a bank, Citigroup, and a conglomerate, General Electric. That was in 2006, the year before the iPhone. But by 2016, after the, after the smartphone decade, this is what the chart looks like. Look at this. It's dominated by technology companies at much greater valuations than the energy companies. ExxonMobil's still there, but they shrank a little bit, and they're way down the list. But this chart was published in 2016. 
So a couple months ago, I said, Jay, I wonder what happened since 2016. Did it change? Are there new companies? Maybe it's changed in some way. Check this out. I updated the chart in April, and this is what happened. On average, these tech companies added $200 billion to their market capitalization in just the span of 20 months. These are the companies that are driving dematerialization. These are the companies that are driving cloud services, mobile computing, mobile apps, and artificial intelligence. And the stock market is rewarding them. But I did this update a month and a half ago, and so then I thought, you know, I'm coming to DockerCon. I should probably update it. What happened in the month of May? What do you think happened? Did it go up? Did it go down? It's unbelievable. Here's May. In the month of May alone, most of these companies added a bill $100 billion to their market capitalization. Even Facebook, which is having about the worst year they've ever had, grew in this period of time. It's really remarkable. So the stock market is sending a very clear signal to your company, dematerialize or else. Now you might think, well, wait a minute, Apple's a hardware company, so why are they on that list? Why are they dematerializing? What a lot of people don't realize about Apple is they're quietly building an enormous software business. If you took all the digital services, software sales, content sales, mobile apps, and so forth, if you took all those services and broke them out as a separate company, call it iTunes, and you listed it, it would be ranked number 87 in the Fortune 500, ahead of all these famous retail chains. Apple's quietly becoming a software company. And Apple senior management has already given guidance that they expect revenue from services to comprise half their revenue in the next two years. Watch this space. Yesterday, Steve Singh said every company will be a software provider. I agree with him. He's right about that. These trends drive it. Wall Street demands it. But that doesn't mean every company is going to be successful as a software provider. Not everybody's going to make the evolutionary cut. It takes two things to succeed. The folks at Capgemini and MIT Center for Digital Business published this awesome report with this great title, How Digital Leaders Outperform Their Peers in Every Industry. They looked at companies, 400 companies across every industrial sector, and they made a radical insight. Their observation is that the companies that are mature in both digital intensity and transformation management outperform their peers. You got to get both right. It's not just about adopting new technology or digital transformation. It's digital intensity. It's a ferocious commitment to digital technology and a mandate from management to drive it through the whole organization. That's what Wall Street wants to see. The companies that master those two things generate 26% more profit than their competitors. That's why you don't need to worry about competition. If you get these two things right, the competition will take care of itself. You'll crush them. The timing's perfect, because we're just about to launch the Internet of Everything. We've been moving in this direction for several years, for about five years. Now, a lot of folks, when they think about the Internet of Things, they think about smart devices or network devices. That's definitely a part of it, but that's not the whole story. It's not just devices, it's also about sensor networks connected to cloud computing, delivering digital services that generate huge data sets, really big data sets. Data sets that are so big, they exceed our human capacity for comprehension. That's why we need machine learning and artificial intelligence to manage and make sense of those giant data sets. Let me illustrate the scale of this opportunity for you right now. When everything's connected, we're going to take the hundreds of millions of computers that are already out there, the servers and the laptops and the desktop computers and so forth. Those are already connected to billions of mobile devices, and that number grows by about a billion and a half each year. And soon, there'll be tens of billions of smart devices out there. And in turn, those smart devices will be communicating with trillions and trillions of sensors embedded in physical infrastructure, embedded in the environment, embedded, embedded in industry, embedded in our cities, in our buildings, even in our products and our cars. That's the scope of the opportunity. This is a chance to reinvent your business and grow to remarkable heights. It's not limited to technology companies. Every company is going to be a technology company. All those connected devices generate an enormous amount of data. In 2010, we crossed the zettabyte threshold. Before 2010, we used words like petabyte and exabyte to measure large data sets, but we needed a new word. We generated so much data in 2010. A zettabyte is a million, million gigabytes of data. And by 2014, we had quadrupled that amount. And every indication suggests that by 2020, it'll grow a further tenfold. And of course, that's just at that point when all the Internet of Things devices are going to happen. And so we're going to see that number grow and grow and grow. This is why we need artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are a consequence of big data. 
we need them in order to master all the data. This is going to transform companies. There's a concept that not everybody's familiar with called the digital twin. But I want you to remember this term, digital twin. It's already being used in some industries where they have very complex equipment. Think of like jet engines. So they're using digital twins and jet engines. What you do is you instrument that entire product with all sorts of sensors so that you can track every single part and you can determine whether or not there's wear and tear. And what they do is they build a perfect digital representation of that part, of that, of that entire product. And the digital representation is like a software model that lets them know. It alerts them to the wear and tear, the use, the time to replace, the time to service it, and so forth. That allows companies to operate more efficiently. That allows companies to do predictive maintenance, anticipatory maintenance. This concept of a digital twin is going to be driven by these gigantic sensor networks that we're starting to install in everything. The way I like to think about it is this way. Software models, you can, you can model anything in software. You can model a business process, you can model a job function, an entire company can be modeled in software. But in the past, those software models were conf confined to the network. They were confined to the digital domain. Today, what's different is software models are operating in the real world. Software models determine how things work in the real world. That's what the digital twin does. You use the software model, the digital twin, to decide how to operate that piece of equipment, how to optimize a plant, when to renew a product, when to optimize a process. The best illustration of this that I can think of is robotics. Now, I want to be really clear about this. I've been talking about vaporizing things and invisible software, and what you must understand is that software, automa software automation is enormous. It's an enormous process, but it's invisible, so I can't show it to you. Think of robots as that part of the iceberg above the water that you can see. That's what robots are. They're like a physical manifestation of software automation. Now, there's nothing particularly new about robots in manufacturing. They, robots have been on the factory floor in auto shops for 30 or more years. But these robots are deaf, dumb, and blind. They can't see human beings. They're actually dangerous for humans to be around. The new generation of robots, thanks to sensors, actually can see us. This Baxter robot by Rethink Robotics cost about $22,000. That puts it in the range of every, every small business, every small manufacturer. And it's got a face on it. It can actually see you. It's not going to harm you. This means that robots can work alongside human workers, augment them, make them more productive. We're starting to see robots in every part of the supply chain. Robots can now handle very delicate tasks, like handling produce or a bottle in this example. Some companies are rushing to announce that they're building the first robot factory. JD.com JD is one of the big e-commerce companies in China, and they have this whole robot facility that they just talked about. You start to hear about dark factories where there's no human workers at all. You just put components in one end and finished products come out the other side. It's like a machine that makes products. Adidas has announced that they've got a new thing, Speed Factory. It's a robotic factory that could do mass customization at scale. So those are robot factories, but other parts of the supply chain are also being robotized. For instance, ports. You now have robotic ports in Australia and other parts of Asia. Maersk, the giant shipping company, has announced a robotic container ship. No human people, no human crew aboard that ship. Already, we're testing robot trucks here in the United States, in Nevada, and also in Europe. Robot warehouses have been a thing for several years, thanks to Amazon's acquisition of Kiva. We're starting to see robots show up in the retail shop as well. These adorable robots from SoftBank, they're called Pepper, and they're designed to help people navigate through the stores and find things and make intelligent recommendations and so forth. But some folks want to vaporize the store altogether, and they're thinking about robotic drones that'll just do dr delivery straight to your home. Now, I know this sounds like science fiction. I know there's probably some folks saying, come on, you, you can't possibly tell me that we're going to robotize all of manufacturing. Well, yeah, I can. Welcome to the adjacent possible. See, for, in order for us to get to a point where all those different robotic systems are stitched together, today they're all siloed and separate, to stitch them all together, we need a few things. First, we need rock-solid digital identity at the item level, at the individual item level. And I'm working with GS1, the global standards body for identification, to develop that digital identity. The second thing is that we need smart contracts encoded into the blockchain to track those items as they move through the supply chain. The third thing we need is artificial intelligence to govern that, artificial intelligence that spans the entire supply chain. And the fourth thing we need is containers. Containers that allow us to use a multi-cloud strategy to track those products as they move from one robotic system to another. Guess what, folks? All four of those steps exist in some form already. There's your adjacent possibilities. There is the cone of possibility expanding. 
Now, in this short talk, I've covered an awful lot of stuff, and I've told you we're dematerializing everything we possibly can, from products to retail, consumer experience, the idea of ownership of physical goods, even dematerializing labor and intelligence. What some people take away from this is a mistaken impression that I'm saying that we're devaluing the stuff, that we're destroying the value in these things. That's not true. That's not what I'm saying. I want to be crystal clear with you. What I'm talking about is value multiplication. This is the key takeaway. This is why you're going to migrate as much of your business as you can to the cloud. Because the value is in the network. When we dematerialize things, the value shifts to the network. And what Bob Metcalf told us 40 years ago is the network is a value multiplier. Not just the telecommunications network, but all the networks in your business. That robust and rich developer network that does innovation on top of your platform. All those network products that generate all that data, that drive the network intelligence, that helps you optimize your business. These are the building blocks for the future of your business. I urge you to go out and embrace them and drive that through your entire organization. Folks, I am Robert Tursik, the author of Vaporize, the 2016 Book of the Year. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here at DockerCon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good job. I don't need that. All right, let's see what my fortune is for today. Okay. All right, this is, this is a little bit different from everybody else's, I've got to say. It says, never follow a world-renowned author and industry evangelist on stage at a major technical keynote. Huh. I guess uh, that's a little bit more of a warning. I guess confidence can vaporize as well. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. So that was a great look into the digital future by Robert, much of it being developed by many of you sitting in the hall with us right now. I'm part of the customer success team at Docker. And our mission is to enable and accelerate the journey to your digital future. A journey that begins by considering where you are today. Because your journey starts with your resources, with the people, the processes, the technologies that you have in place today. And then it moves along a path that defines your digital future. And as Robert said, the future is defined by software. It's defined by all the apps that you've yet to create. And how quickly you can develop those apps depends upon the decisions you make today to free up your scarce resources. So over the past few years of working with our customers, we've heard repeatedly your need to innovate your need to develop new applications, your need to deliver more value to your organization. It's a constant top priority. But you're held back by the overwhelming burden to care and feed for the many mission-critical applications that you've amassed over the decades. And this can leave you deadlocked. How do you free up the scarce resources you need to drive innovation when those same resources are tied to existing commitments? So innovation gets stuck, right? Or at best, it's dramatically underfunded. By the way, clearly we're not the only company promising to solve the innovation problem. And I'm sure you've heard similar promises and you've seen other approaches. Other companies say they can help, but typically their way conveniently forgets about what you have in place today, and it takes a clean slate approach to innovation, requiring you to invest in new people, new processes, new products. Or said another way, it attempts to solve for your 20% by ignoring your 80%. And at Docker, we believe that isn't really a feasible approach. Our goal it's to help you strike a better balance between the investments and the apps you have today and those you want to develop to take you to your future. Okay, so what is our approach? It's an approach that's focused on you. It puts you at the center. It's based upon your reality. It's based upon your choice. The reality that you need to free up the resources you have in order to fund more innovation 
and the choices you want to make to select the right infrastructure for your business, the right development frameworks for your applications, and the right time to transform your existing apps. So let's look at that approach. And when we developed this approach, we, we didn't take a clean slate either. It, it was built with you, our customers. We learned from you, and actually we continue to learn from our customers every day that we engage with you. And many of the customers who helped us define our approach are actually in the room right now, and they're speaking with us at DockerCon throughout this conference. So our approach is designed around four cornerstones, each of which has a, a supporting work stream, and it's backed by a set of detailed methodologies and tools and assets. But don't worry, I'm not going to dive deep into consulting methodologies. But I, I do want to give you a feel for what each of those four cornerstones are. How do we approach this app modernization journey? And, and by necessity, it starts by looking at governance, right? Governance defines the foundational processes that support your organization and which influence all of your subsequent technology decisions. Now, governance is, is a broad topic, and it covers a lot of areas such as, do you have the right skills within your team, within your applications team, within your operations team, within the 24 by 7 support centers that will support your applications in production? You have to have the right skills there when you start the containerization journey. It involves understanding the application service levels that you've committed to your business and that you need to maintain. And it involves maintaining compliance with your SecOps policies, for example. So by definition, it's a, it's a broad area. But with you, we determine which of your existing processes will continue to support your business and which need to evolve to support your containerized end state. The second area is platform. So this is a global architecture on which your containerized apps will run. So do we build on your existing on-prem infrastructure? Or, like many of our customers, do you use this as an opportunity to move your apps to the cloud? And how many clouds and which clouds do you want to support? What are your HA and DR requirements? How will this platform integrate into your existing assets like storage and networking and your monitoring tools? These are all decisions we make with you as part of that journey. And then there's pipeline. Pipeline is the end-to-end -end delivery pipeline used to build, integrate, test, deploy your apps in a highly secure way. Do we integrate containers into your existing CI pipeline? Or do we help you architect a new continuous delivery process? How do we guarantee the integrity of your applications as they move, move from build to pre-production to production environments? Again, decisions we make with you. And the final cornerstone are your apps themselves. Which apps do we containerize in what order? What are the deployment patterns you want to use? If and when? Do you want to begin the app modernization process for those containerized apps? When we're looking at applications, our goal is to start with a few targeted applications, deploy them all the way into production, and then scale across your whole app, your whole app portfolio. OK, so that was the four cornerstones. And, and we actually consider each of those cornerstones throughout your journey, whether it's your first project with your first app, whether you're containerizing your apps at scale, or whether you're innovating to get to your digital future. So look, the most rewarding part about my job is getting to spend time with our customers and learning about the, the great things that you're all doing with Docker. And during this conference, we're, we're really happy. We're thrilled to have over 20 of our customers get up on stage with us and share their container, containerization journey with you. These are companies that all have different goals, different challenges, and different starting points. But what they have in common is that the Docker container platform and our approach to app modernization reduced the, op the operational burden of legacy apps and accelerated their new innovation. And I want to highlight a couple of those customers to you today, um, both of which are actually uh, very close to my heart. So, First is MetLife. Yeah, you, you could probably detect by now. So MetLife are from my hometown, Cary, North Carolina. 
And uh, they're a three-time presenter at DockerCon. Their the MetLife journey spans new microservices, traditional apps, and even databases, right? So MetLife actually containerized databases and to support them in production. So a great achievement there. Interesting thing about MetLife is they actually started their Docker journey with a new app. But then they found that by containerizing existing applications, they created a self-funding model to accelerate their new initiatives. So make sure you meet with Jeff and the MetLife team this week. Check out their presentation uh, here with us uh, at the conference. And then there is Societe Generale. Um, look, we've been lucky enough to partner with Societe Generale almost since the beginning of Docker as a company. They've shared their containerization journey with us at all eight Docker cons, from their early days of standardizing on our container platform to building new apps to where they are today, which is opera operating containerized services at tremendous scale. The Society General team truly are trailblazers. We're very happy to have Frank, Cedric, and the Society General team speaking again at this DockerCon. So you know, make sure you reach out to the team and spend some time with them. And as much as it's great to share these stories of our customers doing amazing things, it's even better when you hear from them themselves. This takes us to Liberty Mutual. L Liberty Mutual is a great example of a customer who needed, to build, who needed to build a bridge between their current environment, their move to a hybrid multi-cloud, and their longer-term vision to vaporize existing ways of doing business. We're thrilled to partner with Liberty to continue to support their journey, and I'm pleased to introduce Eric D. from Liberty Mutual to tell you more. Thank you very much. All right, man. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's see what the demo gods have in store for me here with this fortune cookie. Oh, wow. This must be a cruel joke. I'm not sure about this anymore. Being a uh, diehard Celtics fan, this is going to be a tough one to say. You'll knock him down like Steph Curry's three-pointers today. Well, all I got to say, Warriors, is next year, watch out, the Celtics are coming for you. <clears throat> so, hello this morning, welcome. Um, great talk by Robert, and a theme that resonates strongly with what we're seeing within our industry and the transformational journey we embarked on several years ago. I'm really excited to be here today, share the story of what we've been doing at Liberty Mutual and what we've experienced with our digital transformation. This encompasses how we've leveraged Docker Enterprise Edition as part of the foundational technology fabric in our journey over the past two years. These couple years have been very exciting since we began our partnership back in 2016, a time filled with a continuous cycle of changes. This technology landscape that we're living in is evolving at a pace never seen before. In Liberty Mutual, our teams are thriving now and working in an agile environment. Step back for a moment here and talk a little bit about Liberty Mutual Insurance. So our background, we're a 106-year-old history in the insurance industry. We're a diversified global insurer. We're the third largest property and casualty insurer in the United States. We employ over 50,000 people across the world. At Liberty Mutual Insurance, we help people preserve and protect what they earn, build, own, and cherish. Keeping this promise means we are there when our customers need us most. Throughout our operations around the world, we are committed to providing insurance products and services to meet the needs of individuals, families, and businesses, offering a diverse and dynamic work environment to our employees, and supporting our communities. As we look forward in our future at Liberty Mutual, one of the terms widely used in the industry today is disruption. I feel that disruption and change drives opportunity. These are new opportunities, great opportunities for you and your companies to reinvent and differentiate your businesses in a way never before possible. Across the insurance industry, there are many changes underway. We are adapting the way that we work, evolving the way that we deliver services to meet our customers where they are at. The digital economy is reshaping so much of how we've traditionally interacted and transacted with our customers. Growth in areas such as the sharing economy, 
new digital currencies, blockchain, and usage-based insurance models, we're now able to reach our customers in ways never before possible. Autonomous vehicles, they are entirely reshaping the automotive and transportation industry, changing how we travel and driving new ways to reinvent traditional insurance models. The smart home, this provides us a great new means to be proactive in what, how we give value back to the people, our customers, and their homes, preventing things like water damage, improving their security, and optimizing one of their most valuable assets. We've only begun to see the great opportunities that the Internet of Things will create across the world. Everything, everywhere, connected across an ecosystem that will give us greater insight than ever into our customers' needs and behaviors delivering products and services where they are and when they need it. With all of this, I feel the speed that we're building and creating today to capitalize on these new opportunities is more important than our current position in the long run. As we look at this, our teams across Liberty Mutual are anchored on a core set of principles to take action on these opportunities in a quick and aligned manner. Our people are the core of these principles, investing in our people, looking at how we can work differently, becoming a more product-centric organization, and building a sustainable, agile culture that allows us to deliver our customers an exceptional experience. We're looking at public cloud as a strategic enabler for, for our organization, not just another data center, but the new and emerging capabilities that we can quickly tap into to accelerate our business. Our teams, they're focused on driving all that they do through code and software-defined processes today, rewriting how we've traditionally handled infrastructure and operations, allowing them to shift their focus to more differentiating work that will enable Liberty Mutual to grow in new ways. We're focusing on both our existing and, and new applications, building these capabilities so that they can release soft, software rapidly, safely, and securely without any downtime to our business. And of course, something very critical is balancing our investments. This is crucial to our operation as we scale up and invest in these new areas and these new technologies. We need to balance this by driving down our technical debt. As you can imagine, in a 106-plus-year-old company now, we've built many of our systems on what we felt at the time was the most cutting-edge and transformative technology of that period. This has also allowed us to accumulate some level of technical debt that we need to balance out. When we looked and stepped back at our transformational path that we're on, we determined that not everything was going to be cloud-native, and our existing complex portfolio of applications weren't going to magically morph into these beautiful and elegant 12-factor microservice-based applications overnight. We needed to create a means to bridge the gap between our world today and the world that we wanted to create for tomorrow that will ultimately position Liberty Mutual to succeed in our transformation. What we've done is created a multi-speed IT model where we've constructed a traffic system of sorts, a real multi-lane highway that provides varying levels of abstraction to our development teams, allowing them to leverage the capabilities appropriate for their application and move at different speeds based on their needs. This is where the technology that Docker provides began to open multiple paths for our teams to modernize traditional applications. Move these to the cloud in a more automated, portable, and cost-effective manner, as well as enable new teams to write modern services quickly, building off from open technologies. It's a classic saying that the technology is the easy part, and creating and building this culture is the hard part. I wouldn't argue that, and that's our experience at Liberty. I feel this may hold true more in the future now than ever, as the velocity of technology change just keeps increasing. While there's no magic that'll make traditionally siloed organizations such as development, operations, and security come together and work in perfect harmony, we've found that by way of creating a new environment, bringing the right balance of culture and technology together, where teams can now look at situations more openly, collaboratively, and drive towards delivering new innovative capabilities to our business. Trust is now being built across these traditionally disparate teams creating a meaningful and real partnership where our people are now part of the same team working towards a common outcome. This, I feel, cannot be accomplished and solved for by technology alone, 
But what we've seen here at Liberty Mutual is that Docker is truly a transformational technology. It's helped us dissolve our previous assumptions about how app development, operations, and security should be done, and finding this balance between people and technology, building a new way to work more openly, eliminating organizational boundaries, and empowering our teams is the key that's going to create the culture that will fuel our future. Let's examine each of these areas a little more closely. Starting with our developers. The end-to-end -end experience we create for our developers is absolutely critical to our success. At Liberty Mutual, we strive to enable all of our developers to be as effective as possible. One of our areas of focus is to enable our development teams to go from ideation to production in a single day. We set out to enable an integrated experience that abstracts our development teams from the complexities of infrastructure delivery, test automation, security, and compliance. These critical functions are being automated, API enabled, and now part of our pipelines to production. This, our, this enables our developers' code to be delivered continuously throughout our technology platforms. The Docker desktop experience with Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows has been a significant technical, neighbor, technical enabler at Liberty Mutual. Developers, they finally have consistency now getting from dev to prod and a local experience that can truly emulate what they see in production. The simplicity of the Docker image format, partnered with the vast library of new innovative technologies and paired with the visibility we now have into the full stack, has allowed us to reinvent our traditional processes. This is providing our developers on-demand access to the best tools and technology and allowing them to focus on delivering value to our business. And security. Our ability to manage risk and secure our environments isn't something optional. It's a must, and it's at the forefront of all that we do. Within our security, risk, and operations teams, we've seen great progress in the level of transparency and traceability we can gain with containers. And we've done this while removing friction from the de development process of getting code into production. We're now moving towards a state of continuous enforcement that insights can be driven from both at build and at runtime, allowing security controls to be shifted left, automated through software-defined policy, and visible to our developers for the right reasons, but not being abrasive in, the, in their overall process flow. The overall lifespan of our environments has shrank considerably. We're moving from an average system age of several years to what is now months or days. With Docker, we have the ability to repave the entire platform rapidly. This inherently improves our ability to address vulnerabilities and removes risk from our environments. What we're finding with Docker and the great work of all our security teams across Liberty Mutual, that security is no longer being bolted on after development has started. It's baked in from the start. Looking closer at our operations teams, the reliability and scalability to our systems, it's an evergreen priority for all of our teams at Liberty Mutual. As we move forward with greater speed than ever, we can't compromise this. This directly impacts our ability to service our customers. Across our teams, operations developers, they're now aligned. They have great appreciation for what they each provide, beginning to work in the same manner where traditionally manual intensive operational activities are now being rewritten as code. Container technology is arming our teams with the means to make our workloads more portable than ever. Seamless movement across cloud providers is now becoming a reality. We can align our workloads where we can get the best capabilities at the best price. Docker's beginning to improve our consistency and re repeatability across our application ecosystems. By embracing immutable systems, eliminating human access, and building our infrastructure as code, configuration drift across environments is becoming a non-issue. This all is really allowing our people to shift their focus from manual troubleshooting to optimizing our workloads across the globe. As we look at our results here a little bit, this is a question I get asked often. What results are you guys actually seeing at Liberty Mutual with Docker? These are some of the highlights I'd like to share of the great work the teams across Liberty Mutual IT have driven over the past 24 months with Docker as a core technology enabler and partner. Adoption of the technology has been rapid, growing from 952 services at the end of last year to 
to over 2,000 services today deployed across both production and non-production environments. This level of adoption for us wasn't planned to happen so quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and through that, we hit a few bumps along the way. Um, to us, though, this is where the partnership that Doc provided really stood out. Their commitment to supporting our journey, evolving their platform to meet our needs, and also working openly alongside us has been great in so many ways. As you may recall from the improvements we've seen in the security space, we're now able to repave our infrastructure and technology platforms much more quickly. Our systems are living for less than 90 days compared to three years for traditional virtualized environments. Historically, our data centers, which are highly virtualized today, were growing at a rate of 20% year over year. With help from some of the container technology from Docker, this is helping us balance our technology investments. For the first time, we're beginning to see a direct decline in our overall server footprint across our data centers. In closing today, I'd like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. This is a quote from our CIO, James McLennan. This quote, it's part of our IT manifesto, our road ahead, and exemplifies the way we are working at Liberty Mutual today. In a world where we can't predict the future and new competitors can come from many directions, we will win by being able to embrace change and reconfigure our priorities in real time. Docker has helped us with many of our current challenges, but we're also seeing it as a strategic enabler for our future opportunities. Now is the time to get started with your journey. Take this opportunity. Look at your business across your enterprise. The container technology that Docker's enabled, it's not reserved for only the cool, new, innovative things your teams are developing. There's great value in looking at this more broadly. Whether you're an all Intel-based Linux shop, have some proprietary flavors of Unix and hardware to go with it, or those Windows systems that we all have that haven't been dusted off since 2003. What you'll find is a new way for your teams to work towards rewriting their legacy. And you'll see even greater value in the pervasive culture you start to create within your IT teams that will empower them for years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Another round of applause for that amazing story. It's really exciting to see how a company like Liberty Mutual is pushing into the future with technology like IoT to change how insurance can engage with us, their policyholders. So to wrap up, uh, some parting thoughts for day, DockerCon Day 2. The future, the digital future, is software-defined, intelligent, and automated. The journey, your journey to your digital future, actually starts with the people, process, and technology that you already have in your company. And moments. To remember to find your moment, find a moment today to connect with each other, and also to find the moment that's going to launch your journey. Um, and last but not least, a couple of reminders. First, make me proud. Go up and introdu introduce yourself to someone new and take a Docker selfie and make it onto our Twitter feed. Then uh, come back here this afternoon, because we have two things. First, we'll have key, uh, cool hacks. It's a great tradition here at Docker to show how the broader community is doing new and interesting things with Docker, from sending rockets to space to keep, literally to keep the Earth safe from asteroids, to how developers are using um, our desktop tools to, um, on a very popular machine learning project. And for everyone interested in serverless, how an open source project Glue and Docker Enterprise Edition can be used to enable serverless anywhere. And also, we will announce the repeat sessions um, that will be uh, going tomorrow. OK. So you didn't think I was going to let you out of here without this, did you? Can we bring the house lights up, please? All right. Did you know these are banned inside of Moscone? Don't tell anyone. House lights up, please. Ready, everyone? One, two, three, cheese! Let's do this. All right, I think I got all of you. Have a great day, too. Thank you.